Okay, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Dr. Garayas. Today's date is Wednesday, October 21st, 9 a.m. And this class is MED 110, Anatomy and Physiology, uh, which meets for our Zoom sessions uh, Wednesday mornings, 9 a.m. Now, uh, for those of you who are not uh, at the Zoom session and you're watching this as a recording, um, in order to garner attendance, uh, uh, those of you who are on the call currently already have attendance, uh, but uh, if in order to garner an attendance, please, before like, I don't know, Saturday, uh, do one thing, something, a task discussion uh, or your uh, case study. Now, of course, this is uh, week two, what is due today, um, your discussion and your lesson. The task was easy. That was just signing, um, signing the form. Please do that uh, if you have not done so already. Um, but what is this week? This week is the chemical basis of life. And as we talked about last week, we looked at this photo, which is really important regarding pathophysiology. Um, this one right here. Can I move this? How's this? Copy this image. Make my life easier. Okay. So when when we're thinking, and why'd they block out this poor man's penis? Um, this is how you should be looking at pathology or disease. Like I stated before, before I knew what medical terminology was, I thought pathology meant the path, the pathway to getting sick. Patho patho means disease, but there is a pathway. So when you think about it, atoms make molecules, molecules make cells, cells make tissues. And today we're we'll going to be talking about the chemistry. How does the atoms and molecules, how, do, didn't you ever wonder why when you jump in a swimming pool, you don't fall apart? I remember as early as uh, I think like uh, second grade, I used to always wonder why if I jumped in, a, like I, if I throw cereal in water, it gets soggy and then eventually breaks apart. But why as a human being, I don't jump in water and I don't break apart? And um, we're gonna be answering that. And if you see, if I look at problems at the atomic and molecular level and cellular level, and if I could stop the problem here, it won't all the way, it won't go all the way to um, multi-systemic organ. And that's our problem because by the time we see our patient, there's problems. There's more than one problem and there's multiple problems. Um, for those of you who work in the business, when did you ever have a patient who come in and only has a single diagnosis? Uh, lucky if we walk away with three or four of them all at the same time. So um, I'm from the Department of Internal Medicine, so I'm more about prevention. So knowing and understanding the pathway or the pathophysiology of disease, then we can, and we know how to normally build up a human being, then we could do something about it earlier. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the main purpose of, uh, 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 because I always get that question, Dr. Grias, I thought, because I thought I was gonna take my chemistry or my biochemistry class later. And, and um, my answer is all of these courses are related and they're related for you to do your job in the, in the future. And if you look at, um, if you look at the, the things that um, we need to do today, what are our goals? We want to talk about uh, why you don't fall apart in a pool. So we're going to talk about bonding, the different types of bonds, and the relative strengths of all these bonds. Because not all the time I want something to be super, super glued together. There are times where I, wanted, I want some things to break apart. So we'll be talking about uh, um, really quick elements of atoms, but we'll be focusing more on chemical bonds and chemical reactions <clears throat> because these are the things that, um, that guide uh, normal human processes. Um, and uh, we'll be relating it to also metabolism on how you break down your food to do things. And that will be, and then that will get us to the discussion of what's, what are you composed of? And you're composed of inorganic compounds and organic compounds. And essentially inorganic compounds are things that you know grow on the ground like you know um, salts and zinc and 
and, and copper, you know, uh, the metals, which, which you have trace elements of in your body. But the majority of you are made out of organic compounds. And there's these lovely notes here in, um, this is your task two on your step two. There's notes here and looky here, it goes through the things uh, that are relevant to these videos and they also add this thing here, chemistry of water. We're going to be talking about the different types of mixtures, and we're going to be talking about um, how to make Kool-Aid. And of course, uh, the Carolina labs here, again, we're not doing this lab, but in relationship to digestion of uh, proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, and proteins, fats, and carbohydrates are your basic organic compounds. So this week will be the first week that you're gonna be doing your concept map. So um, uh, after we go through a couple of, uh, or maybe we go through a couple of videos, or a couple of topics, I'm gonna to show you how to um, uh, start building some of these. But if you look, the, uh, the concept map is going to match uh, you know, what we talked about. So we're gonna talk about basic chemical structures, macromolecules, bonding, and water. And all of these things relate to each other. And I'm gonna to try to um, uh, segue in between them and then also give you a, a quick sample on, um, on how to put it together. So let's, we now know the chemical basis that we're made up of a whole bunch of atoms. Atoms make a whole bunch of molecules. Molecules then uh, uh, um, get glued together and make a whole bunch of um, cells. Cells get glued together to make a whole bunch of tissues. Tissues get glued, you know, get folded and glued together to make an organ. Organs get uh, uh, grouped together to make um, uh, systems. So let's look up, let's look and see bonding. And let's, uh, and if you notice that for this particular, uh, for this particular week and chapter, they did not refer to your OpenStax textbook. So you're not gonna be looking into the uh, OpenStax for this particular thing. So um, um, we're gonna be looking into um, uh, these topics here. So one of these things that I've always said was, any educational video, no matter how entertaining they try to make it, is really boring. I will fall asleep and I'll always fall asleep. And also, same thing with your textbook. No matter how snazzy they make it, you'll always fall asleep if you're not paying attention. Now, there's something called active listening. So now that we know our goals and our objectives, your brain now should be geared to, okay, I goes, I need to know uh, these topics. So let me pull out um, Microsoft Word and let's watch a video together. Let me minimize this if I can. And I'm going to pretend to be, uh, I'll also have notes on this as well, um, uh, my own notes, but I highly suggest that you watch the videos and you look up the notes here, uh, the Carolina notes there on the bottom, and then compare it to mine. Don't just, uh, don't just go, oh, these are Dr. Grise notes. I'm going to, I'm going to listen to them as if they came down, you know, they came down on stone tablets from whatever higher power you believe in, right? Uh, it's, it's, it's one version of how, how to uh, do notes and, and one version on how to do concept map. But ultimately, you have to figure out what kind of note taking is best for you and what kind of um, concept maps uh, that, um, that your brain can, um, can, can, can utilize better. So let's go into Humans, like chemicals, are really all about bonds. Think about all the relationships in your life. You're a casual acquaintance to some people, a colleague or friend to others, and maybe more to that someone special. Maybe you're dating someone casually, or you're in a committed relationship, or you're married. There are all kinds of different combinations of people out there. And sometimes, you know, people fall for a vampire or a werewolf. Who am I to judge? Fact is, each type of relationship requires different things from you and the other person. But if you play your cards right, these relationships allow you to relax and escape the stresses that come with the constant search for affection. Distance is important in relationships too, of course. Too much distance makes it hard to stay focused on each other and requires a lot of effort to keep things together. And I may not have to tell you, too little distance 
can be a problem as well. Everyone needs their space, and when you don't have any, you just end up pushing away from whatever's crowding you. In this way, atoms are a lot like us. We call their relationships bonds, just like we do with our own relationships. And there are many different types. Each kind of atomic relationship requires a different type of energy, but they all do best when they settle into the lowest stress situation possible. The nature of the bond between atoms is related to the distance between them, and like people, and vampires and werewolves, I suppose, it also depends on how positive or negative they are. The difference is that unlike human relationships, we can analyze exactly what makes different kinds of chemical relationships work, and that's what this episode is all about. But people, please remember that we... Okay. So when you're watching a video, you break it down. So let's go back to uh, my notes here. So the first thing you heard, he, uh, uh, this guy said, uh, um, he used the word relationship like six times, right? So that already, I now know that it's the relationship between, uh, um, between atoms. Okay, we already heard that. Now, it is what? Distance dependent? It's also uh, dependent just like a relationship, positivity and negativity. So if a uh, negativity, negativity, I have to spell that out. You know, to this day, I still spell out Wednesday, Wednesday. So energy. Now, in a relationship, right, you want the lowest energy possible. Who wants to work in a relationship? Nobody, myself included. So right there, hey, doesn't this look like I'm building a question? Right? Could I ask what it goes, well, what is an actual bond? Oh, it's a relationship with atoms. So which of the following are part and parcel of um, um, uh, bonds between atoms? They're distant dependent, they're po it goes, um, they're also dependent on its um, the atom's positivity, positivity or negativity, and the energy must be at the lowest energy possible for you to survive. Because we're an efficient machine, right? Now, if I'm doing notes, that's one way to do it. See how this relates to this relates to this. Well, we can do Hello. the same thing. We can do the same thing here, right? Where I could put what bonds, and then I could uh, insert and draw my arrows. Uh, shapes, I keep on forgetting one. Then you draw arrows here, right? And then arrows to what? Distance dependent, positivity, negativity, energy must be at the lowest. So now you can have a visual representation of your notes and that is that's all that a um um a concept map is it's the same thing as your notes but it's a more visual representation of your notes so that you know it's how hard it is to remember words but do you see how much easier it is uh to remember um uh, a picture and then instead of positive negative I can make my life easier plus dash minus right and then uh, I put the last one okay and then I could write in here lowest energy This a little bigger. So when you look at that, do you see how I can easily remember this better than this? Because it's a picture and it's using less words. And that's what a concept map is. It's just a picture that now you know that distance, positivity and negativity and the lowest energy possible is related to how bonds work. And that's the, and goes, and that's the initial and uh, introduction uh, uh, for this video and also it answered the question 
goes it goes why don't it goes why don't i when i jump into a bathtub why don't i fall apart because there are things that are keeping me together things that are keeping my atoms together and they're distance related positive versus negative uh, related and um it requires the lowest energy because i need to be as efficient as possible so now that you now that you know how to kind of take notes and you'll have my notes i'll put i'll be putting them up uh, later this morning but now you can see how you can make a concept map. And I highly suggest doing it on uh, Microsoft Word and using insert illustrations and shapes. It may take a little bit longer, but another way you can also do it if you're not so computer savvy, just get a nice clean sheet of like um, printer paper or bond paper and um, you know, uh, take something like a small shot glass or you know, maybe you have a stencil because you have, a, uh, children in the house and then you just uh, take a ruler and just be neat about it and then take a picture on your phone and then send it other students do it that way but uh you could see how this also could also help you on your presentations uh, how many times have i seen boring boring presentations even by professionals and because they put way too many words on their powerpoints um, I took a training about 15 years ago called Death by PowerPoint, and it's all the stuff that I used to do as a fledgling professor. And then now that I won't do as much because especially when I'm doing my own, if I'm creating my own PowerPoints, I make it more visual. And you can see how more visual, uh, it's better. It's better for learning. It's better to remember stuff. So let's go back to the video and then uh, let's, let's, let's look up Let's see these different kinds of bonds. At Crash Course, do not dispense relationship advice. First things first, why do atoms do this at all? Well, like everything else in the universe, atoms do whatever they can to reduce their overall energy. And they reach their lowest energy by achieving a balance between attractive and repulsive forces, being neither too clingy nor too aloof. So when two atoms approach each other, the electrons of each are attracted to the protons of the other. This is the electrostatic force. Like charges repel, opposites attract. Like it All right, I don't think he's going to explain this part. Let me let's show you an atom. There you go. If you look at an atom, you are essentially you're on your atomic level smaller than a cell you're essentially made of these atoms in the middle of the atom you have uh um these positive particles called protons these neutral molecules called neutrons and then on these outer shells of energy uh it's negative you have electrons and um if i had two atoms that bumped into each other um they tend to share energy and think of these shells as energy shells and that's what he's referring to the positive and negativity of protons and um uh, electrons let's go back to the video real life or at least paula abdul songs i know I'm old. So when one atom is attracted to another, just like Edward Cullen and Bella in chemistry class, to use a slightly more timely reference, it gets stressed out by the attractive force and tries to relieve the stress by getting closer. We've all been there, right? That hot, nerdy vampire girl in your chemistry class. It just it's intense. The pull is so strong that the stress level or energy rises when the two are separated so they stay close. But sometimes they can get a little too close. When that happens, the nuclei repel each other because of their like charges and the energy between them rapidly increases and they both back off just enough to find that perfect little distance between them and everyone relaxes. This ideal wonder- Now, you could use the, the, another analogy that they use in chemistry is like the way, you know, a magnet has a positive and negative end, how um, uh, negative and negative uh, forces repel each other, positive and positive forces repel each other, but opposites attract like positive and negative. And you could see like when you mess with magnets, there's a tension. And then 
uh, when you let go of that tension, it wants to go to its lowest energy, which is what? Positive and negative like to stick together. Negative and negative like to repel each other. And uh, positive and positive like to re repel each other. Distance is the bond length. It's the distance between two nuclei at the point of minimum energy. In other words, where the attractive and repulsive forces cancel each other out. The distance at which these two atoms of chlorine reach their minimum energy caught between the attraction of the electrons to the nucleus and the protons repelling the nuclei is the bond length. That energy minimum, which we know absolutely is negative 239 kilojoules per mole, occurs when the distance between the atoms is zero. Uh, this is the part where I skip because I'm not going to this is not a chemistry class, right? I'm not going to talk about this. So when you're watching this video, this is when your brain checks out. You don't need this because is it part, knowing the exact amount of energy required, is that part of, is that part of my objective? It is not. I need to know the bond types. So at this part, I'm, I'm pretty much, I'm checking out right now. I am, this is not what I'm looking for. I'll either fast forward or I'll just let it pass by. 0.00199 nanometers. That distance is the bond length of Cl2, chlorine gas. Now, because the electrons are attracted to both nuclei in the molecule, they actually spend the majority of their time in the space between them. This is often described as sharing electrons, and we call this kind of bond a covalent bond. About now I'm going to start to pay attention, because now he's going to start to talk about the types of bonds. So he said the word covalent. Co means sharing, right? Uh, if you're co-pilot, that... You know, that's the, uh, that's the guy or gal next to you flying the plane. Valence is the outer shell of the electrons. Remember, I just showed you the picture of the atom, and then they have these energy shells. So who's going to share the outer, uh, the, the very most outer shell of energy? And um, he just mentioned chlorine gas or Cl2. Chlorine doesn't exist in nature just by itself walking around. It would be highly reactive. So... Uh, that's an example of a covalent bond where chlorine and chlorine will share its outer electrons and sharing will be the word co or covalent. Sharing is equal. As you know, I have an older brother. The strength with which an atom holds shared electrons is called its electronegativity. The electronegativity is of various elements are all super well known and waiting for you in tables on the internet. If two atoms in a bond have very different electronegativities, like say hydrogen at 2.1 and oxygen at 3.5, the electrons are more attracted to the atom with the higher electronegativity. The difference is so great that the electrons spend most of their time around the stronger atom and much less time around the other one, like how all of the neighborhood kids wanted to hang out with John, my older brother, because he was more charismatic. When the electrons hang out closer to one side of the bond, it creates a slight negative charge in that area and a slight positive charge around the other atom. This separation of charges is called polarity. And it's the polarity of the molecule that these atoms form, H2O, that makes water the most important molecule on Earth. Covalent bonds like this, where electrons are attracted to one atom more than... All right. He said, he goes, now, that's when you start to having to pay attention. He said something, that is the most important element. Human beings are made out of um, more than 60% water. And also, wasn't that one of our goals uh, to know a little bit about the chemistry of water? So now he stated that what? Polarity, also known as electronegativity, the relationship of pluses and minuses, that's how water um, holds things together. And since oxygen is such a big molecule and has a high electronegativity, the hydrogen uh, of H2O, which is water, the hydrogen gets attracted to the, um, uh, to the oxygen. And there's going to be partial pressures um, or partial electronegativity. Um, and we're going to see that in a, uh, in a minute. But right now, when you're watching this video, he said the word water. He said the, most, the word important. So now I'm gonna, my brain's going to turn back on again. It's always in monitoring mode. I didn't mean like your brain shuts off, but you should always be in monitoring mode. And that's what active listening is. You're monitoring for what the speaker, uh, for, for certain keywords and key things that you should pay attention to. The other causing a separation of charges are called polar covalent bonds. But when a covalent bond forms between two identical atoms, like the two chlorine atoms in our graph earlier, the electrons are distributed evenly. We call this a nonpolar covalent bond. But you've also got to consider the middle option, where the atoms aren't identical but have very similar electronegativities, like hydrogen with an electronegativity of 2.1 and sulfur at 2.5. The difference here is so tiny that the electrons are pretty much still evenly distributed, and we call that a 
non-polar covalent bond as well. There's a huge world of important chemicals that have these kinds of bonds, so many, in fact, that we will dedicate a couple of separate episodes to them. Covalent bonds tend to form from non-metals and sometimes metalloids, those elements that have both metallic and non-metallic characteristics. That's because most of them hold their electrons so tightly that they're more likely to share them with another atom than to gain or lose them altogether. Metals, on the other hand, have loosely held outer electron shells, so they're constantly dropping electrons and becoming positive ions. And when positive ions... So, am I paying attention to any of this? Not really, because is that part of my goal? Talking about metals versus non-metals? Nope across negative ions like those formed from halogens for instance you have to know what's going to happen they are attracted to each other which means energy yada, is yada, yada. a wonderful point of minimum energy this type of bond is unsurprisingly called an ionic bond a bond formed between a positive ion and a negative ion because the ions are formed when one atom loses electrons and the other gains them we often say that an ionic bond is formed by the transfer of electrons from one atom to another and we can calculate the amount of energy that exists in a bond between ions at a given distance using a formula called coulomb's law Oh, you don't want to know Coulomb's law. So right off the bat, just as a review from where we're at right now to keep everybody on the same page, we talked about, he talked about covalent bonds. And we already know covalent means sharing. And nonpolar sharing means there's no, there's no one side that wins. So they're both, both positive and negative share equally. So an example he gave was Cl2 or chlorine gas. And the other example he gave is H2S. Now, uh, uh, polar covalent, right? We talked about polarity and electronegativity. He gave the example of water because remember I said that um, oxygen had a high electronegativity and the um, hydrogens are attracted to it. So water is going to be, uh, uh, water is more polar. Now, the last one that he just talked about is uh, salt, sodium chloride. Now, Sodium alone is Na plus, and um, chlorine alone is Cl minus. Uh, if you remember, if you remember this from, let me go down here. If you remember this from like uh, high school chemistry, let me just do a new one here. I want a new page. If you remember from a little bit of from high school, Sodium is Na, and then you see that it has a plus on it. That plus means that uh, this particular, uh, this sodium is an ion. That means it's reactive. It's reactive because it is missing an electron. So if it's missing an electron, that's missing a minus, that means it's going to have an extra plus. Now chloride is Cl minus. And of course, you see that minus, that's an ion. That means it's highly reactive as well. That means it has an extra electron. You put them together, you have sodium chloride. That is an ionic bond, right? Where one electron gets passed over to, uh, to an another molecule and that ionic bond is yet another type of bond and it forms sodium chloride, which is table salt. Okay. And which is a big thing because um, your body, we as human beings aren't just made of water, we have salts in our, in, in our system. And when we, we hook up a line to you, uh, I'm, I'm hooking up NSS, which is normal saline. And that is a 0.9% sodium chloride solution in water. So when we put, when we put fluids in you, I don't, it's not just water, it's water with a little pitch of salt. And it's important because sodium and chlorine, they're reactive and the, this, and sodium alone is ion, chloride alone is ion. By the way, you take sodium powder, you throw that in water, it'll explode. Chlorine, in theory, it should do, but I know, I know for a fact that uh, uh, sodium powder, if you throw that in water or you get it anywhere near water, it'll explode because it's highly reactive, okay? But then uh, you, sodium chloride, is it reactive? No, it just sits there on the table. Let's go back to the video. It only works for ionic bonds because the calculation requires the charge ions equals the product of the two charges. Yeah. 
the distance or radius between the two nuclei, all multiplied by a constant. 2.31 times 10 to the negative 19th joules per nanometer. Do not need to know that. Of course, the radius that. also has to be expressed in nanometers. You gotta make the well, ion is plus one for this class for the radius. And finally, a quick calculation tells us that the due to an attractive force, which certainly, of course, you might have noticed that negative 8.37 times 10 to the negative chlorine, really don't that care. was for a whole mole of molecules. When multiplied by the fact quite strong. And because they consist of a positive covalent bonds. And so those are our three types of bonds. A nonpolar covalent formed by the equal or nearly equal sharing of two electrons between nonmetal or metalloid atoms. Polar covalent formed by the uneven sharing of electrons between two nonmetals or metalloids. And ionic formed by the transfer of electrons from a metal to a nonmetal. It's important to remember though that there aren't only three designations for chemical bonds. Just like human relationships, bonds don't always have really well-defined boundaries. Everything is a continuum. Labels are used Useful, but they can only take us. So let's go back. There to are, it. however, that was important. It's like human relationships, bonds don't always. So we talked about electronegativity, the relationship with pluses and minuses. And the higher the electronegativity, the more reactive something will be. So we talked about nonpolar covalent, so chlorine gas. It's not really too, it, it's not going to bond with anything because it's nonpolar. It's, uh, it, it's sharing equally, so the electronegativity should be low. Uh, so chlorine gas, is, it's, um, uh, it won't do much. Now, polar covalent, right? It's going to react a little bit because the electronegativity is low. And remember the polar covalent, and a good example is water, right? It's going to react to things. And I already mentioned the ionic is high electronegativity it will definitely react to things. Um, so an ion is, if, if you, um, an ionic compound or uh, an ion floating around in your body, uh, it's gonna do a lot, uh, it's gonna do a lot of chemistry, meaning it will, um, uh, it will react with things, right? So if you have medications that are ionic, um, a classic example is lithium, Li3+, plus, that means it's um, short of three electrons. Um, lithium we use as a mood stabilizer in, um, uh, in psychiatry. That's really, it's a really, really tricky medication because it's highly reactive. It's an ion. It's very small. It can pass through a whole bunch of things, um, especially the blood brain barrier, which is very, very iffy. Um, now those are three types of, uh, uh, bonds and, uh, you could watch, uh, this as well. And there's also in your lesson, a um, 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 some some more powerpoints, but uh, this does the same thing as uh, this lecture. But you could see now how we kind of skip through the the lecture on the parts that are important, not on the parts that uh, because if you're starting there, just imagine like if you're a typical student, you're going to start copying down Coulomb's law and all that thing. Is is there anywhere here that says that we have to do Coulomb's law? No, it isn't. So we discussed what an element is. It's a form, it's, it's, um, uh, it's uh, the basic, basic building block of who you are and what are they made out of? What are the, at the atomic level? We talked about electrons, uh, protons and neutrons. We now talked about three basic chemical bonds and there's a couple of more that we're gonna talk about and um, those are gonna be my notes. Now let's now talk about chemical reactions. How do, oops, that's the one that had, this one's a bad link, but here, this one's the good link. Let's talk about this, okay? Now, what does this mean, fancy schmancy? Well, think of it this way. When you look at things, I like looking at things in a simple way. And you start off with reactants and then you end up with product. So for example, in human body metabolism, I, start, I have to meta, meta, change. So bowl means growth. So ism, process of. So metabolism is simply the processing of reactants, you know, um, the food that I eat, the air that I breathe. And then I have to get over this energy, right? Because remember, my body likes being at the lowest energy possible. And this energy that I have to overcome is called activation energy because there has to be energy involved in making a product. 
And what's the product that we're looking for? We're looking for oxygen plus glucose. Glucose is a six carbon sugar. How do I know? It's OSE, o -S -E, and remember that suffix means sugar. So I start off with food and the air that I'm breathing, and what should I end up with? I should end up with oxygen and glucose and uh, some other products we're gonna talk about. So in order to do that, I have to get over this hump. So see it this way, like, you know, remember when you're a kid, you're riding a bicycle? Which hill would you like to go up to go down? Right, which one's the easier one? You wanna pick the easier hill. And this hill is, is um, what do you call it? It's less steep and it'll get me, you know, uh, let's say it get me to where I need to go, the products, quicker. So what helps us? Well, this protein called an enzyme. Enzymes, um, uh, how do you know it's an enzyme when you're looking at it in medical terminology? The suffix should be an ASE. So let's say, for example, I'm an enzyme and I want to break down a carbohydrate. So the carbohydrate is my reactant. And of course, my end product is any fuel that I need to use. And in uh, our case, it's glucose, six carbon sugar. So I'll have an enzyme called amylase, A-M-Y-L-A-S-E. And that's, we have a ton of it in our salivary glands. And we're going to talk more about that in um, our GI lecture, right? So we start off with carbohydrate and with the enzyme amylase, it'll be faster and quicker. And we're going to get to the product of um, uh, glucose much quicker than we didn't have an enzyme. And remember the theme that we must be at the lowest energy possible because I'm a machine, I ha I'm taking in fuel, I want to be as efficient as possible. Because if I didn't have the enzyme, it would take what? Much, much longer. Or, or I won't be able to even get up that hill, okay? But with an enzyme, it'll be faster. Now, let's say the reactant is protein. So I have proteinases. I have a ton of proteinases, and again, we'll be talking about in our GI lecture. I got a ton of them inside my stomach and it requires a, a low pH or an acidic pH, so it'll help break down proteins. Another thing that helps break down proteins is heat. So I start off with the reactants and I have a proteinase, and the proteinase will then give me my product, which is what? Glucose, do you see the theme here? I need my fuel, oxygen, glucose, and we're gonna talk about why it has to be oxygen and glucose next week. And lastly, if I have fat, right? Let's say I ate a whole bunch of lard this morning, right? Um, I'm going to break that down and that's called the lipase. So the lipases will break down and it'll get to my product. And with all these enzymes that we talked about, it overcomes the activation energy. It lowers significantly the activation energy of a reaction so we can get to our products faster and better. Because if I didn't, or if I have an enzyme deficiency, um, the typical transit time of 12 to 14 hours, you know, from eating to uh, getting through your gastrointestinal system will take a heck of a lot longer. And I'll be weak because I won't get my products in time and uh, my fuel in time. So what kind of questions could I ask? I could ask, what's the enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates? You'll tell me amylase. What's the enzyme that breaks down proteins? Proteinase. What's the enzyme that breaks down fats? Lipases. And what do enzymes do? They lower the activation energy to get to my product. And ultimately, what's my product? Oxygen and carbon dioxide, okay? So that's enzyme. And did you notice that the enzymes that I mentioned are chemically specific? So for example, a proteinase will not break down fat. Proteinase will only break down proteins. A lipase will not break down a carbohydrate or um, what well, doesn't theory. But a lipase doesn't break down a protein. A lipase will break down lipid or fat. So there's like, um, it's called an enzyme substrate, pro, uh, uh, substrate complex. Meaning to say is the enzyme is highly chemical specific for what it breaks down. And it's kind of like a lock and key mechanism. So let's say for example, I have the enzyme lipase. So only lipid will fit like a lock and key. Okay, and then it will activate the enzyme substrate complex and then the, uh, the chemical process will go. And of course, the substrate will now change or metabolize 
into the product that I want, oxygen and carbon dioxide, okay? Now, there are things that, even, that help the enzyme even more, and they're called either coenzymes or cofactors. You might know them more as vitamins. Now, here's my thing about vitamins. Um, we did an experiment in pharmacology. In medical school, you do these experiments on each other. Yeah, you got to sign a waiver. It, and sometimes it's kind of dangerous. It's odd that way. Well, there was one experiment that we did in pharmacology regarding uh, multivitamins. So we had the whole class, it was like 400 of us, um, uh, take a whole bunch of multivitamins for a couple of weeks. Then we did a 24-hour urine sample over a couple of days over, over about 100 students. Guess what we found? Um, if you are healthy, right, um, and uh, the age range was anywhere from like uh, 25 to 45, typically, and if you have a good um, urinary system, you're going to pee out 99% of that vitamin, and you're just going to create, as my professor in pharmacology called, quote, colorful urine. Now, then, Dr. Grice, and why do we take vitamins? We take vitamins as a supplement. So actually, a good physician, if instead of just giving you vitamins, right, let's say, for example, for example, my son has a vitamin D deficiency. I could give him vitamin D until, you know, uh, until his stomach fills up with pills. It's not going to change his vitamin D status. But I know a thing or two about physiology. So I know that sunshine uh, um, has UV radiation, which will um, um, promote vitamin D synthesis. So what did I do to correct his vitamin D deficiency? If it's good weather, even if it's not so good weather, um, I have the kids um, eat their breakfast outside um, on the porch. So they eat, they get a little bit of UV radiation because even though uh, it's cloudy, uh, there is still UV radiation uh, uh, when the sun is out. And guess what happened to his vitamin D deficiency? Went away, right? Now, another uh, thing I'm gonna talk about briefly is uh, this pH. What's pH? pH is the negative log of uh, the concentration of the hydrogen ion. And um, mission and scale. Let's find a pretty picture. Yeah, this one's good. And uh, I'll copy it. And then let's put it here. Okay. Let's look at the pH scale briefly. Well, not briefly. Let's look at it. So if you look at the pH scale, neutral is... Um, around seven. Human being, it's around 7.4, around there. Uh, I remember, I forgot it was 7.35 to 7.45. It's around there. So neutral is in the middle. Now, the closer your pH scale gets to the number one, that means my patient has a lot of hydrogen ion. And we already know that hydrogen ion, right? The ion right here, it's highly reactive. And uh, actually, pH actually means the negative log, the negative logarithm of the concentration, and in brackets, that's a bracket, concentration of the hydrogen ion. Okay, that's what actually pH means. So what does that mean for us? Well, if I pour milk in your eye, you'll just be offended and be like, what are you doing, right? But if I poured lemon juice in your eye, it will highly react with your eye and cause significant amount of pain. If I pour gastric acid on your eye or your face, it'll start eating away at your face, right? So that means the closer you get to one, it's highly reactive, right? Milk, black coffee, tomato juice, not so reactive. But lemon juice, gastric acid, highly reactive. Pour lemon juice on your car. Leave it on there for a couple of days. See what happens. 
And gastric acid, you may be wondering, well, Dr. Grias, if it's so reactive, why doesn't it just burn a hole right through my stomach? Well, it can, and that in the case of an ulcer, but what do we have lining our stomach is a whole bunch of mucus that will contain all the gastric acid within our stomach. And we also have sphincters here, these little circular muscles that uh, act as valves to make sure this acid stays in there. But if you have a bad street taco and some of that acid you know, kicks up into your esophagus, then you get heartburn, right? So I could ask you the question, my patient has a pH of seven and you'll tell me, well, that's neutral. My patient has a pH of five, then my patient is what? Acidic. And remember, homeostasis, we always need to be in the middle. If my patient is too acidic, it's gonna cause problems. And we're gonna talk about those problems at another time. And if uh, the more acidic something is, the more hydrogen ion it has. Now what's on the other side? Is hydroxide ion. And what does hydroxide look like? OH minus. How do I know it's an ion? Because it has a little minus, and I know it's highly reactive. So for example, I throw egg on your face, again, you will be minorly perturbed, well, majorly perturbed because no one likes egg in their face, right? Uh, as the saying goes, but what if I put ammonia or bleach on your face, right? Or, you go, uh, or, or other concentrated alkali, an alkali is another word for base. So if something's basic, right? The closer it is to 14, pH of 14 and pH of 13, Right, and uh, what's like pH 13 is, um, uh, some of you may remember, you know that um, uh, oven spray? I remember I was in third grade and my mom made me uh, clean out the oven. And um, I, didn't, I didn't turn on the fan like she told me to. I didn't put up the windows like she told me to. I just wanted to go outside and play kickball. So I sprayed without a mask, without anything. And then uh, six hours later, uh, my mom and my sister found me passed out on the floor. Because why? These concentrated alkalis got in and did what? Reacted with my lungs, and then I passed out. Right? Yes, Dr. Garayas, as a child, was not a very bright young man, nor did he listen too much. Right? Um, not much has changed, uh, but I got an MD now, so I guess it makes things better. So if you see here, if you got bleach and ammonia, Right, which by the way, do not mix. I've done that too as a medical assistant. Please don't do that. You'll have to evacuate um, your office. Um, so it's going to form a highly alkaline gas and that's not good and it's highly reactive. And here's the neat part. If I take something that's highly reactive, OH minus, and this other thing, H plus, that's also high rea highly reactive, and I put it together, I'm gonna to make a neutral solution. And guess what we're made out of? We're made out of H, two, O. Pause for effect. Water. This is one of the Illuminati things that when I was studying chemistry, I'm like, whoa, what the heck? Right, because it's OH minus and H plus, and you put that together as water. What am I made out of? Water, what's my pH? Around 7.35, 7.45, so, uh, whoever says that we're not designed, this is pretty neat. So this also reminds me, where does my patient need to be? They need to be in the middle. And we're going to be talking about in the future, these buffer systems that are always constantly trying to push us back in the middle. So what could I ask you on a midterm or on an exam? I could ask you, what is pH? pH is the negative log of the concentration of the hydrogen ion. What does that mean in English? That means if on the pH scale, seven means neutral. Closer to one means very acidic. Closer to 14 means very basic or alkaline. All right. And that is my mini lecture on the pH scale. Now you know what the pH scale is. And ladies, don't fall for that stuff where, um, uh, uh, well, let's go back to this picture. There's two things that Procter and Gamble and all these, um, what do you call it? Uh, the, the soap and the shampoo companies um like to promote for example uh hand soap its ph is 10 right so naturally it's going to kill uh most bacteria because bacteria love us at where neutral so when you see germicidal special germicidal soap it's like a load of hogwash because all soaps are germicidal it's going to 
It's going to kill stuff, right? And so, and it does it via pH. It, it has a very adverse pH towards, um, um, towards bacteria. And another thing for that other stuff, like, you know how they say, you know, your shampoo is pH balanced for a woman. Uh, women don't have any different pH than men, except for the genital urinary area. And by the way, what's the number one thing to wash down there? Soap, right? So any of those douches or any of these, I don't know, these vinaigrettes that some of these companies made, made of could, are actually chemically detrimental uh, to your genital urinary area, both externally and, and internally, because it's going to mess with your natural pH. So every time I see that commercial for like, oh, balance, pH balance for the woman, I just giggle because it's hype and it's like, um, um, I don't know. It, it preys upon the ignorance of laypersons. Laypersons aren't stupid. It's just that they don't have your training. They don't know what this is. So they think what? Like, uh, uh, you know, when they put collagen in uh, uh, shampoos and it makes it very, very, that's like saying, oh, you need some protein. Why don't you, why don't you rub, rub a steak on your face? It's the same thing. But uh, hey, that's, uh, that's America, right? That's uh, marketing. Now, what can we do if I don't want a chemical process to happen? This is the actual basis of pharmacology. So you have like a substrate and an enzyme, right? And that substrate could be a chemical telling the enzyme to go do something or to go make something. But do you think I could block it? Yeah, I could take another chemical and block it. And um, that's what we do in medicine all the time. But again, right? Um, it, is, it has to be a lock and key fit. And that's the reason why um, a lot of people love getting high because the natural substrate uh, for getting high is rare. Norepinephrine and epinephrine and dopamine, those are your um, chemicals in your brain that uh, promote euphoria, you know, that happy and high feeling. What's easier and faster? What has a much, much lower en activation energy? Cocaine. So you take the cocaine, right? But the problem is after a while, your body, and this is one of the major, major obstacles regarding drug addiction because it's chemical. After a while, your body will want the cocaine and won't want the natural dopamine and all the natural things in, in your life. Which by the way, a lovely, uh, um, if you want the research, uh, shoot me an email and I'll, I'll send it to you. A lovely article by the Journal of uh, Sports Medicine a couple years back. There are over 250 million Americans on antidepressants. That's just way too many people, right? You cannot say that America is that depressed. But nowadays, most doctors are kind of lazy. They, they want to keep your, um, your patronage to their office and they want to make money. So they just give you the quick fix. But um, sports medicine found that people who work out regularly at least three times a week, more than 45 minutes at maximum heart rate, it produced the same amount of dopamine, nor epinephrine, it goes, and epinephrine than people who are on max dose of antidepressants. Isn't that neat? That's neat, right? Um, I am the biggest pessimist in the world, but I work out every day. That's why I don't let the world and this whole COVID mumbo jumbo get to me. Because number one, I don't watch TV anymore. I don't, I, I, um, I just do Hulu and, and Netflix like a normal person, right? Uh, you want to get depressed out of your mind? Just watch the news. Just watch the news for 30 minutes. It'll make you have such a negative view on the world. And if you have such a negative view on the world, what kind of substrates, what kind of chemicals will your enzymes in your body start producing? The kind that will promote what? Depression and alcoholism and all, all, all those nasty things that the world has to offer. Now, this now jumps into, um, um, uh, what do you call it? this part here? Uh, ignore this part because we're going to be doing this part when we talk about uh, um, gastrointestinal uh, uh, stuff. Uh, skip down to in your notes to this part because remember, part of what we're going to be talking about is the different kinds of organic compounds. So now, did we mention a lot of inorganic compounds. Yeah, we mentioned salt and, 
uh, you know, hydrogen sulfate and chloride gas. But who you are are these organic compounds. And uh, organic chemistry only deals with these compounds because these are who you are. So carbohydrates, if you use your medical terminology powers, are made out of carbon and hydrate, which is water, right? When, they, when someone tells you to go hydrate, it's water and water is made out of hydrogen and oxygen. So carbohydrates, um, it's abbreviation, it's like slang in um, chemistry is CHO. So a carbohydrate is made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Doesn't that look like a beautiful all of the above question? Which of the following, uh, uh, which of the following, um, uh, um, what do you call it? elements comprise a carbohydrate? A, carbon, B, hydrogen, uh, C, oxygen, D, all of the above. It screams in all of the above question, doesn't it? Now, they have classifications, monosaccharide, disaccharide, oligosaccharide, and polysaccharides. Now, monosaccharide are the products of what we want. Glucose, fructose, ribose, and de deoxyribose. Now, glucose is the main star because that is the basic, basic fuel of our body. Your brain only likes glucose and oxygen. Everything else is no bueno for your brain and for the rest of your body. And actually your body will take fructose and make it into glucose, ribose and make it into glucose and back and forth. So glucose, the six carbon sugar, is the goal of our metabolism. It's why we eat. It's why we breathe. Now, disaccharides, a little bit more complex, maltose and lactose, and we know about lactose. That's that milk sugar. So um, people who are lactose intolerant, uh, those are the people who find out probably around puberty that they eat some ice cream and then they're on the toilet all day or they're farting all day. Mm -hmm. And another term for farting, please use the proper medical terminology. The proper medical terminology is called flatus, F-L-A-T-U-S, flatus. Oligosaccharides, that means it has a couple of monosaccharides and they build up like, you know, Lego. And polysaccharides, those are comp complex carbohydrates. These are the things that make starches, cellulose, and cellulose is really neat. It's the reason why we should eat a lot of salads, even though I'm, I'm uh, I don't know, I'm mentally allergic to salad and fruit, unless it's like, you know, a fruit is mixed with rum, which I'm not allowed to drink anymore. But cellulose is neat because cellulose is um, non-digestible. And you're like, wow, what do you mean by that, Dr. Grice? Well, what happens when you eat corn at your family cookout? What ends up in the toilet? Corn. But here's the cool thing. As the corn was going down through your gastrointestinal system, it was picking up cholesterol. And cholesterol is the vehicle of getting fat in and out of your body, right? So eating a lot of uh, vegetables will not only give you um, uh, vitamins, because it's a nice way to get vitamins because your body likes to process things, it doesn't like pills. Uh, um, um, it will now, cellulose is uh, non-digestible. So, so you eat spinach, where does it end up? You eat your greens, it always ends up in the toilet, but it takes a whole bunch of cholesterol with you. Um, I have to uh, eat my oatmeal every day Oh, that's bad news. A, a plain oatmeal is just, but I don't have to take, um, uh, I don't have hyperlipidemia anymore. I don't have uh, cholesterol trouble anymore because why? That's like my medicine. I eat that garbage in the morning and what comes out in the toilet the next day, right? Sorry to be visual, but it'll help you remember. It comes out with the cholesterol, so I don't have to deal with it. Um, and try to eat your oatmeals without sugars and stuff like that because it's much, much better. Now, what's proteins? Proteins are made out of carbons, hydrogens, oxygens, and nitrogens. And that's why its slang is C-H-O-N or CHON. They're made out of little building blocks or monomers, little Lego called amino acids, okay? So the amino acids, you got like, what, 26, 27 of them? 26, 27 of them in your body. And depending on the order of the amino acids, it makes all these different proteins. And we already talked about one of the most important proteins, enzymes. Okay. Oh, there's like 20. Oh, I'm a horrible chemist. I thought there were like 26. Now you also have essential and non-essential ones. And the essential ones are the ones that are located in um, in most of your diet if you, um, if you have a, uh, a nice balanced diet. Now, what are lipids? 
lipids are made out of the same things of, as carbohydrates, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, right? Um, but the difference it goes, the difference is it's not much, not much oxygen. And uh, sometimes it has like phosphorus in it, but typically CHO. And what are lipids? They're fats. Now, fat is not a bad thing, but it has, just like everything in your body, it has to be somewhere in the middle. Okay. And what do we look at? We look at in our blood triglycerides, phospholipids, steroids, waxes. And these, because we do need lipids in our body. So you can't eliminate fat, but you can minimize it when uh, in your diet. And that's what we try, have to try to do because, um, for example, fatty acids, right? Of course, it goes, it's a, um, um, it's a lipid that's uh, acidic, right? Fatty acids could be saturated or unsaturated, right? So if they have a whole bunch of uh, covalent bonds in it, that means they're generally uh, uh, solid at room temperature. F saturated fatty acids are really, really bad for, um, um, for your arteries. Uh, they'll clog you up because it, it's, it's solid at room temperature. Like my favorite thing back in the 80s when I worked in, I used to work in a uh, movie theater and we used to have these huge brown vats of coconut oil. That's what we used to cook um, all the, um, the popcorn with. That's why popcorn tastes so good. Because why? Saturated fatty acids, right? Um, but unsaturated, those are the ones that have uh, less, that has double bonds, right? And they're generally liquid at room temperature, like safflower oil, which my wife years ago switched to because, um, uh, you know, stuff like lard and coconut oil, uh, which I still use when I make cakes or pies, because that's the best. If anyone remembers the brand Crisco, you guys remember that? Oop, I missed a, well, yeah, fat is awesome, uh, Miss Mandy, <laughs> right? Now, the last, uh, so saturated fatty acids, we try to minimize that, but that's what makes food taste really good. Uh, but hey, uh, Remember, you should be, uh, especially as you get older, um, uh, you start to having to start thinking about eating for fuel and not for taste. Um, that's why when you're in the hospital, all the food tastes horrendous because that's not food. It's management. It's medical management. And that's what I always try to tell my patients. My patients would be pleading with me, especially my cardiac patients, when I have them on low salt, low or no salt diet and low fat diets they'll be crying and like, hey, Dr. Grace, can you get me a burger? I'm like, well, if you want to die, sure, I'll get you one. Nucleic acids. Now, DNA and RNA. That's important because the DNA is in your nucleus, and we're going to talk about that next week, is the, the main brain of your cell. And remember I told you that all the proteins, they take the 20 amino acids, and depending on the order, it makes different proteins. Well, who tells the of uh, the cell on what's the order of the protein the dna right now rna is the messenger okay it goes from the nucleus of the cell and it has it it's kind of like the foreman it then tells the cell uh, then what the big boss or the blueprint says so it translates it now this thing about this virus that's why viruses are so ubiquitous and they're so dangerous ubiquitous meaning they, they can go into anybody and they go into any cell because viruses, they're very, very small, right? They can easily slip through your skin and that mask you're wearing and the cell wall, the cell wall, it'll go right through it, right? And it'll go right through the DNA wall, right? And then what will it, I go, then what will it do? Yep, it, okay, we're using the chat. It will hijack the DNA and will hijack either the DNA, RNA, or both, and then it'll change the instructions. It'll change the instructions from, hey, make good things like proteins to, hey, let's make more virus, okay? So that's the, the really scary part of uh, this virus stuff that's going around because the virus can, it's a parasite. It can survive. It needs us to survive. Now, what's also the good news? Well, it goes, if, it goes, because there's a whole bunch of people who are working in the field 
um, they're exposed to it, they're exposed to stress. But if you mitigate your stress, you keep yourself healthy, you eat right, you sleep right, your immune system should do what? Keep the virus at bay. Or you could be positive and not and be asymptomatic. Um, I was wondering if this is the class that I mentioned. Uh, we currently out of my, um, I have like 81 or 78 um, advisees currently. Uh, in the last six months, seven of them became positive. Now, all seven of them didn't infect their family, uh, thank heavens, and all seven of them work in the field in high-risk areas, either in the hospital or at an assisted living, and they're exposed to it all day, every day. All seven of them didn't have to be hospitalized. Now, why is it? All of them, guess what? Between the ages of 25 to 35, they, they, they all take care of themselves. All of them are non-obese with, with, no with no comorbidities, meaning they didn't have like diabetes or heart problems or anything like that. So they got well really fast. Now, what the media doesn't want to tell us, right? They keep on just focusing on death, 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 because there, there are preventive measures in place. And the PPE, its preventive measure is not to stop that virus. That virus will get in whether it wants to or not. The PPE's function is to prevent, uh, um, is to prevent, um, uh, what do you call that? The other 249 things that might lower my immune system, like bacteria, fungus, and all these other garbage in the air, right? And also other, uh, uh, um, other contaminants, right? So that I won't be immunocompromised. Oh, by the way, nice little statistic. You can look it up to confirm it. Please don't take my word for it. Uh, oh, by the way, all of all seven of those students, um, were, um, all of them upon interview, they stated, they stated that all of them were wearing their mask. Uh, uh, all of them were also um, following the protocols of uh, washing their clothes separately or washing their clothes at, the, um, um, at, the, at their facility of where they work. So that also shows that if you pay attention to, uh, like you wear scrubs for a reason, your, your PPE and all of that, you still can get it, but it won't spread. And that's, that, all of that that I just told you is hard to communicate to a lay person because they don't, they don't know what we know. And so that's why they just say stuff like, we're all in it together, uh, wear your mask, uh, you know, but it's really hard nowadays because, Everyone is now equating masks and all of this with politics. And they're equating science with politics. And uh, Dr. Fauci said it himself a, a week or two ago, it is now impossible to separate politics from science. But you know what? Because at our level, our student level, we have to separate politics and science. We just have to, uh, because we, we're about the truth. We're not about, we're not about um, who, who we're gonna vote for in November. So let's go over the last thing, which is water. So you click on that guide for water. We already talked about ionic bonds. And whatever is the positive is called the cation. And whatever is the negative, anion. And uh, this is how I remember it. Do you see the cation has a plus? So that means it's positively charged. And an anion, it looks like the word onion. And onions make me cry, so crying is negative. I, I don't. Whatever you do to try to remember stuff, that's the way we do it. Now you have also um, some extra notes here about the covalent bonds where you went that solubility, suspension, colloid, and solution. You can read that on your own, but um, things mix differently, um, and uh, and the, their ability to mix or dissolve is called the solubility, and that brings us to water. Now. Water is an aqueous solution. Now, when you're making Kool-Aid, I promised in the beginning of this lecture that I'm gonna teach you how to make Kool-Aid. When, when you make Kool-Aid, you, you have water, which is the aqueous solution, and you have what? So your water is your solvent, and the solute is the powder and or sugar that you put in. Now, it is, it goes, it is a saturated solution if you're in my house, because I'm one of these people who put way too much powder because I like it very sweet because um, I'm on the road to diabetes. So that's a saturated solution. And when it's saturated, there's only so many spaces 
that the water can accommodate for, uh, for the Kool-Aid powder. So if you just put it like my mom does, she barely puts like two scoops. I put like four, maybe five, right? She only puts like two. So when she does it, there's no powder at the bottom, right? So the solvent and the solute are in balance and that's an aqueous solution, right? It's impossible uh, through normal means or non-chemical means to separate the powder from the uh, water or the solute from the solvent. But if I put way too much powder, that will be a saturated or supersaturated um, uh, solution. Now, let's look at water, okay? Things in this universe could be hydrophilic, meaning philic or philia means loving. Hydro is water. So there are certain things that love water, right? Uh, like for example, salt. I put salt in it, it dissolves, right? Um, it doesn't disappear, but sodium chloride is ionic bond, right? And then the water is gonna pull that ionic bond apart. Right, and so, and we know that when we look at the NSS solution that I talked about earlier, when you look at that bag, there's it looks like there's just water in it. So that's high. That's an example of a hydrophilic substance. But hydrophobic, like uh, vegetable oil, you know that when you put vegetable oil in, in a glass and then you put water in a glass, it won't mix. I could shake it all apart and it won't mix, because uh, it is vegetable oil is hydro. Phobic. Phobic is water fearing, right? Hydrophobic. And if you're hydrophobic in real life, you're afraid of the water. Now, why is this so? This is another bond that we, uh, 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 that we didn't mention yet. Water has these hydrogen bonds that can be created because water, we already know, is a uh, polar, co polar covalent bond. And this polar covalent bond, it's polar. So it's going to form a partial, and this delta here is a partial negative, and this delta here is a partial positive. So when, let's take this picture. Can I copy this picture or? Take this picture. And, uh, uh, have to get rid of this, get a new one, and then I'll put this here. Okay, so and then I'm going to draw on it. You could see that this delta here, I like this color. You see this delta here, partial positive. So the hydrogens on a H2O molecule, we'll have a partial positive. And remember we had sodium chloride? Ugh, that's an ugly N, C, L. Remember? Wait, what was the question again? Okay, is it already answered? So sodium chloride. Can I answer it? Huh? Oh, Hold up, I'm in the same room as my daughter. Okay. You can talk to people and be social and try to make friends and be yourself with others. So sodium chloride, remember it was two ions, sodium and chloride, right? So sodium chloride is salt. It's like little powders. Let me draw a little powder. But then when you put it in water, the powder disappears. It disappeared because the sodium and chloride got, got attracted to the partial positive and partial negative. And we know that sodium alone is, has a little positive here. Chloride alone has a little negative and it formed an ionic bond. But if I put it in water, look what it does. The chlorine will get separated from the sodium and then get attracted to that partial positive of hydrogen. And the sodium will get attracted to here and then it'll pull it apart. And you could see you know, in any glass of water, there's only so much hydrogen and oxygen uh, slots available for sodium chloride. So when it starts all filling up, then I'll have extra little powder because it didn't separate. And that's called a supersaturation or supersaturated um, uh, solution. Okay. 
Now, another, re another neat thing that water does is because now you have a partial negative and a partial positive, it causes surface tension. And that's how when, um, if you've ever seen like a drop of water, it's how water isn't just flat. It, it forms like a bubble. And um, that property too, and as you can see here, see these uh, hydrogens, right? They start now getting attracted to the partial negatives of the oxygen because the oxygen is in high electronegativity and it forms this network, right? And this network forms hydrogen bonds. And these hydrogen bonds are much, much weaker uh, than, um, um, uh, than the other bonds that we, we talked about. Okay, and the hydrogen bonds are really important because when we start talking about DNA, these bonds are very fluid, just like water. They bend and um, they can be compressed, which is kind of neat. Okay, so I don't know, have to know, know about heat capacity, but do know and understand that in order for me, I, I boil water, right? Like uh, whatever, whatever, 100 degrees Fahrenheit or whatever it takes to boil water. But if I put things in there, it's going to take a a more time to boil because the bonds got taken up, okay? So what are our takeaways regarding water, right? It's specific heat and specific heat capacity depend on uh, what, what kind of aqueous solution do you have? What's in the water, like salt or whatever, Kool-Aid, right? Water forms hydrogen bonds because of the attraction of the oxygen and the hydrogen because there's a partial negative, partial positive. We already now know how a uh, solution separates uh, things like ions, like sodium chloride, and sodium chloride is a nice example of an ionic bond, and it can be separated in solution, right, in aqueous solution because of water, because of the partial positive, which is hydrogen, and the partial negative, which is oxygen, that this polar covalent molecule forms. You know the, now the difference between hydrophobic and hydrophilic? Phobic, I want you to think what? Uh, things that are that that um, uh, that won't uh, mix with water, like water and oil. Now, when you're making the Kool-Aid, the solvent is the the water, and the solute is the powder. Now, the solvents don't always have to be aqueous or water. Solvents also could be um, oil, or they can also be um, alcohol. Okay and solubility and kind of, and we went over that. And that's pretty much, let's look. Did we go over basic structure of uh, organisms? Yes, we did. Macromolecules and the or organic compounds? Yep, we did. Did we talk about the different types of bonds? Yep, we did. Did we talk about water? Yep. So that's pretty much the lecture. And let's now review real quick what's due for next week. Of course, task two is due next week. Um, and that's this right here, the task, design and submit a concept map of what we learned and uh, uh, try to see how that all connects together, right, visually. Discussion. Based on the completion of the uh, case study. Now, where is the case study? Right here. If you go in lesson two, there's um, an application assignment here. When you go here and you download the case, it's a, a PowerPoint on chemical bonds. And in that PowerPoint, you go all the way to the end. Here's your case study. Okay. And maybe I'll just make it easier for you guys and just put this, uh, um, uh, uh, put this up uh, in announcements. And read through this. This is a neat lecture, uh, but you know, like I stated, I, I try to get, I try to keep away from, uh, um, uh, from PowerPoints. Uh, but your lesson for this week is if you go through the PowerPoint, right, there are, where is it? Here, there are like six or seven questions. So it says CQ number one, right? Assuming all of the following atoms are in the neutral state, which of the atom would, uh, uh, will be uh, chemically inert? Or which has the most complete 
outer shell and reading through the case, it'll teach you how to do that. Okay. And then there's a, there's, there's more and it goes, which one it goes, um, what's the other, there's like six or seven of them. Okay. Let me find. And then also gives you lovely pictures and more examples. And then, um, all you have to do is just submit a Microsoft Word uh, document with uh, with your answers of these questions, and that's that's pretty much the lesson for uh, this week. Does any? Let me stop the recording. Does anyone?